Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today my guest is State Senator Mike Kowal, who is running to become the Republican nominee for Michigan's 11th Congressional District. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. Weren't you running for Secretary of State earlier this year? Well, I had uh, toyed with the idea, and I went around the state talking to people. We didn't uh, technically file or you know, make a commitment. But I wanted to see if there was an appetite for a, uh, a male to be Secretary of State. Okay. So I, I'm assuming there wasn't, and you, no. you say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you're running for the 11th Congressional District. Correct. Okay. Um, if we can, let's, let's talk a little bit about your uh, uh, time in the State Senate, and then we'll move into the congressional races. Sure. Okay? Happy to do it. Okay. Um, you introduced Bill 916. Uh, requiring licensure of secondhand good vendors and junk dealers? Right. What that is, it's, uh, it's to recycle cell phones, and we had to uh, change a little bit of state statute. There's really no, uh, there's no fees involved. It's nothing that would uh, requ require a lot of uh, oh, oversight by the state. But the reason that we had to do it by state statute is if you had a, uh, a stolen cell phone and you were trying to recycle it, because they, they will, re it's, it's, like a, it's like the bottle deposit law, you can make a couple of dollars off of it. So we just want to make sure that the phones that are being turned in are legal and you are right, the rightful owner of that phone before you turn it in. Okay. What was this for um, uh, autumn? Mated uh, locations? Yeah, or? it's like a, a vending machine that works in reverse. Okay. You put your cell phone in and the cash comes out. Okay. And this is a, it's really a good environmental practice because there are some chemicals in the batteries and that sort of thing that we don't want to, we don't want it to get into the groundwater. We're trying to do everything we can to get the, you know, the lead and the copper out. And there's a lot of lead and copper and other chemicals in these batteries. Okay. Uh, what, what's the status of that bill? Is uh, we passed it out of the Senate. It's gone on to the House, and I believe it's sitting on the governor's desk. He may have signed it, and I'm not aware just yet. Okay. Um, you also introduced Senate Bill 924, which would give private security police the power to arrest people. Uh, right. What this is, it's a, uh, you know, with the concerns about Oh, you know, the school safety, we're not really capable of getting enough regular police officers into the schools, so we're trying to, we're trying to come up with other, other ideas as to how to get more MCOL certified police officers into schools. We have a lot of highly qualified uh, people that are retiring but still want to work, you know, a couple days a week or part of the year, but don't want to uh, take on a full-time job. Now, the arrest powers would only be uh, able to go into effect in what we call a geo-fenced area. So if you had the school building, they could only stay inside that fenced area. They could not wander outside that area. So even if they did see a crime being committed across the street out of their area, they would have no jurisdiction, no more than you or I would. So they would get on their phones or their you know transmitting devices and let the local police departments know that there was a that, that there was a crime taking place. These, this has just been in conversation, and a lot of people think because a bill gets introduced that it's gonna automatically pass in the law, but that's not the, that's, that's furthest from the truth. What we wanna do is make sure that every aspect of public safety for our kids in the schools is, uh, is taking taken effect. West Bloomfield schools are doing a great job right now. They're working with the West Bloomfield Police Department and they're uh, getting ready to install cameras in all aspects of the school. So if there is an emergency, it's automatically uh, over to the police station and they can uh, sit at their dispatch and see where the problem you know, arises in the school building in each and every room. And we're gonna be hardening uh, doorways as well. In fact, we passed some funding out uh, just before we got out to make sure that there's money available to make the front doors a lot tougher to get through. Okay, now this Senate Bill 924, doesn't that also apply to uh, businesses? It can, but that's our, they're already doing that. There's 13 or 14 different 
places in the statute that allows this to happen, all we are going to do is add schools into that into that equation as well. So it's not a new concept. It's something that's been going on for a long time. Okay. Um, now, this is an open question for you. Are there a couple accomplishments, you know, bills that you're particularly proud of, of getting passed? Well, I'm extremely proud of the autonomous vehicle bills that we've been able to get out of the, uh, out of the, the uh, Senate and out of the, uh, out of the House. A lot of these bills, have, well, out of the Senate, they passed 38 to nothing, and uh, out, of this, out of the House, I think they passed uh, 108 to 2 and mostly because people were afraid of the technology. It didn't have anything to do with you know, anything other than that. But what this is doing, it's making Michigan uh, the epicenter for research and development for everything to do with autonomous vehicles. As you know, California has been trying to steal that from us for years. They thought it was going to be an easy thing to do to build cars, but as they're finding out, there's only one place on this planet that really knows how to design and build cars, and it's right here in the Detroit metropolitan area. We uh, were the home of the automobile. We put the world on wheels, and now we want to keep the world in the most updated, safe technology. And a lot of people ask me, why, why did you do this? What, what was your interest? Brooks and I are very close. And to see what he's gone through uh, with that accident that he was in, had they had the systems that are in the cars that are being proposed and are being uh, experimented with in the cars now, that accident never would have taken place. And the, you know, we lose 30,000 people uh, annually to uh, automobile accidents of some sort or another. That would be like the entire population of White Lake just disappearing every year. And you don't hear this outcry of, you know, we're losing all these people. We're, you know, what's happening? Why don't we fix this? This is outrageous. It's because we've grown accustomed that car wrecks happen. So what this technology is telling us that car wrecks don't have to happen. We can make it safe. We have, uh, it's called V to V, vehicle to vehicle uh, communications, where the cars are actually telling the other cars what they're gonna do, whether they're moving in that lane, how fast they're going, what, what the conditions are. Then there's V to I, which is to the, uh, basically to the, to the roadways, to the bridges, to um, transmitting devices that are way down the road that'll tell you that the roads are icy, that there's an accident, that there's a problem, and your car will start to understand. And then there's V to X, which is up to the cloud, which gathers this information and relays it back to everything else. So it's really exciting. Um, one of the real interesting components of it is, is that the the center for mobility that's being built out at Willow Run. <clears throat> we had, during World War II, we had Rosie the Riveters out there. They were putting the airplanes together that, you know, the arsenal for democracy. And we, we had that going on, then that went away. And then GM started building cars out there, and as we know, that went away. Well, that just decimated that entire area around Willow Run. So we went to work and we would figured out how to procure this, uh, this site. Um, we actually closed expressways that, yeah, that are in and around this site, and that includes tunnels and a variety of things that, quite frankly, just weren't, weren't being used anymore. And it was, it was in the state budget. We were having to pay to fix potholes. We were having to pay to you know, plow snow. And what's the point of plowing snow on a road that no one goes on? I'm sure we could spend that money out here on Telegraph during the winter. People would appreciate it. So we're turning that into a real-time, real-world test bed, and it's 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 the it's going to be the premier test bed, not only in in Michigan, or the Midwest, or the United States. It's going to be the premier test bed in the world, and because of the work that's going on in our universities, U of M, Michigan State, Northern Michigan, all these universities, Oakland University is playing a big role. And we're, um, we're experimenting with all this and doing the research and the development. And we're seeing companies come in from Europe, from China, from Japan, from anybody that builds cars. Kia is, is coming in, and they want to be able to use this track. Well, with that, you know, they have to pay for it. I mean, it's their, no, there's no free lunch. You know that. So 
with that, they're bringing their technicians, they're bringing, uh, they're hiring our young people out of, uh, out of the schools here in Michigan, out of the higher ed schools. We're starting to see training uh, take place for a lot of the kids that, uh, you know, don't learn like everybody else. They, they learn by doing, and they're not suited maybe for a four-year degree, but they're suited for a, you know, a two-year certificate from a community college, be it welding, you know, uh, electronic, uh, you know, equipment handling, and hooking up these, these uh, computer systems to the cars. Uh, Google has moved here to Michigan. They are in Wixom and they are experimenting and they've actually mapped all the roads in, in and around Novi, Wixom, Wall Lake. Uh, Uber is here in Michigan, in, uh, they're in Wall Lake and they are uh, doing their work with, uh, with a couple, of, they're working with Chrysler, uh, outfitting some minivans. And then we have Lyft here and they're working with GM, they're out at the proving grounds. And everybody's working separately but yet together. The information's all being shared because we have to be of one network. We have to have one way to communicate because Michigan can't be different than Ohio or Michigan can't be different than Ontario in how that communication's taking place because you don't want to cross the border over by Toledo and find out your car just doesn't gather that information any longer. How, how will these cars interact with uh, the cars of today where there's a driver? <clears throat> well, we're gonna have a situation for a while that we're gonna have really smart cars and really dumb drivers. <laughs> I had one almost cut, kill me today on coming over here. But they'll, they'll, they'll eventually catch up. And we know that our cars today, if you're driving a newer model, there's you know lane change assistance, there's backup assistance, some cars will park themselves. Mercedes has, a, has an app right now that you can pull into a restaurant parking lot, you and your wife, and if it's raining, you can pull under the canopy and you take out your iPhone, you tell the car to go park itself. Well, it'll drive in that parking lot until it finds a vacant parking spot and it'll, it'll park itself. And then when you're ready to leave, you're having coffee and you're ready to go home, you call it and it'll come right back and it'll right back where it dropped you off. Then you can get back in the car, you know, and you have manual control of it at this point in time and it'll take you home. And that's the car you drive. Oh, no, I can't afford a Mercedes. I, I can barely afford a, my six-year-old uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, now you're running for uh, U.S. Congress. Yes. Um, what are a couple of your top issues that you see facing the United States today? Oh, the top on everybody's mind right now, especially today, is immigration and uh, the kids that, that everybody seems, you know, concerned about and you know I'm thinking that there, there's got to be a way to to assist these people to go back to wherever they came from and if they want to come here they got to do it the right way I, I'm I'm kind of thinking that a lot of that's got to do with education you know you just can't rush a gate at a concert and everybody's got to do it the right way get in line buy your ticket and then you can come here possibly and, and go to work you know, we have the anchor baby problem where people come here, they have a baby, and right away they assume that that baby is a uh, American citizen. It is not. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Constitution of the United States. So everybody has, my, my, my grandparents came here and they did it the right way. My grandmother through Ellis Island, my grandfather came through Canada and they eventually migrated to the United States. My wife's mom and dad came from Ireland when they came in the 40s, they had to, uh, number one, have a sponsor. They had to have somebody that was responsible for them. They had to have a job waiting for them or else they couldn't come in. It's not like we're trying to keep the world, all the world out. We just want it done the right way. Okay. Um, what is your stance on abortion? I'm pro-life. Okay. Uh, what, what do you think should be done with Obamacare? There's a lot of aspects of it that need to be scrapped. I don't think that, uh, that it's working the way that, that uh, the general public thought it was gonna work. And I think the general public that I know said it was never gonna work, but I think that in some aspects they're correct. But we have to, uh, you know, when I hear, well, let's, let's rebuild it. Well, maybe we just need to start over again. 
So you would be in in favor of scrapping it and then just starting I'd be over in again? I'd be in favor of looking at other aspects, take it apart, see what works, see what doesn't work. I, I fix things. You know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a cabinet maker by trade that got involved in politics by accident. And we did historical preservation work. So what we would do when we had a, we had a real problem child and we wanted to restore it, uh, what we would do is take parts of it that worked, the other parts we'd make anew, put it back together again, and then it would function properly. And I think that's what the U.S. Congress needs to do is see what, what's working and what isn't working. So since you brought it up, how did you first get involved in politics? Oh, it's a long story. You know, it's, I tell people I, I, get, I got involved just by being there. I, uh, I started as a precinct delegate because I was really interested in, in what really got me fired up is when uh, there was some, the single state uh, tax on businesses and we were, just, uh, we were just getting taxed to death, but I wasn't in the position where I could run. I had small children at home and my first responsibility is to take care of those kids. So after they got a little bit older and, and we were, I was getting more and more involved. I was helping candidates that I really believed in that, uh, you know, same thing that I believe in, smaller government, less taxes. And I got to know Brooks Patterson really well. And, and that's a long story of an, uh, for another day. But I've gotten to know Brooks really well. And when term limits first kicked in, uh, he came to me and he says, Mike, we need business people that got a logical head on their shoulders. He said, we want you to run for the House of Representatives. So I did that for uh, two terms after being in our family business for almost 40 years. I did that for two terms. I uh, uh, went out and did a few other things. I got hired by a company to do some work in, uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico and in China analyzing large port, port and shipping pro projects, rail and ship. And my wife got tired of me not being home, so I came home and I, I got elected supervisor in White Lake Township. I did that for uh, six years during the Granholm administration when everybody was going broke. And we, uh, we enhanced the taxable value of the 59 corridor. We created, put the, made the conditions right so there was 3,400 new jobs created. No tax breaks, no special deals, just by streamlining, getting rid of the red tape. And I coined the phrase, roll out the uh, red car roll up the red tape and roll out the red carpet. And it works. It's, it's shocking, it works. So when the uh, when the Senate seat oh, and I had everything all in a row too. I had budget surplus. I had bills paid. Everything was in really good shape. We didn't. We never laid anybody off during that whole downturn. We didn't hire some people, but we laid nobody off. We didn't cut wages. We didn't cut benefit packages because we didn't have to because we were being very fiscally responsible. We lived up to our promises. And the the unions that I worked with there, the police and fire. They knew it was bad. They took a three-year uh, contract of zero, zero, and zero because I opened the books and I showed them what reality was. And they understood it. And they're, they're, to this day, they're great guys to work with and ladies. So um, when, when I was, after my term was pretty coming, I saw I couldn't do much more there, so I, uh, I decided to run for the Senate. So first meeting I had with Governor Snyder, we sat down, I was chairing economic development, and he said, uh, well, Mike, here's the news. He said, we have enough money to run the state for 35 minutes. Governor Granholm left us with $2 million in the bank, $2 million to run a state of 10 million people. Thank you very much. So we started with that. And today, when we, well, the last week when we finished up the budget, I'm pretty confident that when I see the final numbers, we'll have over $1 billion put into our revolving fund, or in some people call it a rainy day fund, but it's a fund that the state borrows money from itself so we don't have to go to other to banks and other lending institutions. And it approves our AAA bond rating. It just makes everything a lot easier. So. It, those are one of the things I'm pretty proud of. Okay.
President Trump is placing tariffs on some imported goods. What are your thoughts on this? Some of them rightfully so. Uh, there are some of the imports that have been coming in that were, I've heard numbers as high as 200 percent, you know, tariff taxes on some of the products coming in from Canada. We, you know, we have to be so careful of how we do that. You know, the, the North American free trade, I think it's a bit of an oxymoron. I don't know how much, it might be free trade, but it's not fair trade. And the example that I give people is China will ship containers of goods to Canada. They offload it in Vancouver. They take the container, they take it to Winnipeg, and say the container has women's dresses in it. So they'll, they'll break the container down, they'll take the women's dresses out, they'll put a belt on it that says made in Canada. It then becomes a North American product and there's no tariffs on it. What's fair about that? Look at all the manufacturers that we had in the, in the South that made blue jeans and fabrics and sheets and pillowcases and socks. Try to buy American socks. It just went away, and it went away because of these unfair pra practices. So, you know, am I in favor of a lot of this? Yeah, I think it's time to really say we're not going to be the, the pushover that we were. Is there going to be pain involved? And I, I'm pretty confident there is because our farmers, um, we grow a tremendous amount of soybean. The Chinese buy from us a tremendous amount of soybean, but it. It's going to cause some short-term pain, but I think long-term it's going to do well for us. Okay. So China is going to be placing tariffs on our soy beans. Oh, they'll, they'll be placing tariffs on our soy. They'll be placing tariffs on some of our auto parts. They'll be placing tariffs on a lot of things. I heard the number of uh, as high as $70 billion, which is similar to what President Trump said he was going to do. But all they need to do is sit down. We don't need to create all these new tariffs. I don't think we need to do that. All we need to do is say, China, whatever rules you put on us, those are the rules we're going to apply to you. Canada, same thing. Whatever you, you know, whatever your rules are, ours are the same. I would take our rule book and throw it away. So we're going to use yours. We're going to use your rule book, China, and whatever you do to us, that applies to you. Pretty basic. Okay. Um, a, a while back, we had the Parkland, Florida uh, shooting, and there's a lot of talk about uh, gun restrictions and things of that nature. Uh, what, if anything, should the federal government do to protect our children in school? We went to school in the 70s, 60s, 70s. How many shootings were there in the 60s and 70s? I don't remember any. There was a few, but there wasn't many. That gun was the same. That gun didn't change. That, that was the same gun. How many shootings do you see in, in parochial schools? Virtually none. There's something else going on, whether it's a social problem, a uh, mental health problem. We need to address the base of the, of the problem. You can't just go after a mechanical device. Otherwise, we'd be outlawing, outlawing cars right now. So it, we, we need to find out why this is happening. Should we get more counselors in the schools? Yeah, I, I think that that would help out dramatically. Should we get more you know, psychologists in the schools? Yep, that would also help out. But what would really help out is parental involvement, getting parents back into the schools. I went to a Catholic school. My mom and dad were involved. You know, if you got chastised or whacked at school, you went home, you got chastised and swatted again. So you didn't do it. Okay. Um, now, in your opinion, should any type of guns, ammo clips, or ammunition be banned? I don't see the reason. Well, fully automatic weapons, which are, are banned right now, I don't see any reason to go any further than where, we already, where we're already at. Okay. Um, right now, the United States is involved in numerous foreign wars, which has resulted in numerous refugees. What do you think we should do with these refugees? Those are, those are really difficult questions to answer, but just opening our doors and letting people in without background checks, without health checks, without a variety of things that are, you know, the, 
good old fashioned checks and balances. Uh, should we uh, be careful with our friends and make sure that our friends that are coming here are taken care of and found jobs and become productive citizens and assimilate into our society? Those are the things we need to look at. I'm not saying that's the case for all of them, but you know, I can show you cases of a lot of the Chaldeans that came here just in the last few years that were Christians were being persecuted, they were they're being killed, their families were killed, their churches were burned down. Um, Turkey's been, you know, a problem with that. We had the Armenian hot, or genocide that we just finally are now teaching about in the schools along with the, uh, the, the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, genocides. These are the kind of things that we need to educate people about. So we have to take care of our friends. Okay. Um, do you think the United States should be involved in all these foreign wars? Not being an insider and not knowing what's going on all the time, and that's why we need a good, strong president that can make those calls. That's, that's, that's pretty much a presidential and a congressional call. When we're getting into a full-blown war, that's a congressional call. So we have to be very careful of where we step in this world and having good treaties with, uh, good fair treaties with other countries that we know that, that the checks and balances that were there, you know, what, what was it Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Those are the words to live and die by. Okay. Do you support building the wall? Yes. Okay. Do you consider Edward Snowden a hero or a traitor? You know, I haven't given that a whole lot of thought since that's been kind of ancient history now. I, I'd have to go back and brush up on that. I, I you know, uh, there's a lot of people we could ask that question about. <laughs> okay, well, just so you know, I've yeah. asked all the congressional candidates that okay. question. So, and we've gotten quite a wider range, range of opinions. Um, do you approve of the NSA spying on American citizens no, in secret? No, not at all. Okay. Um, recently, the state Senate passed a bill prohibiting the state of Michigan from assisting the uh, federal government in warrantless surveillance. Correct. How, how, I, I believe it passed the Senate. It, uh, it passed overwhelmingly. Uni yeah. Was it unanimously? It may have Senate? passed unanimous. I don't remember anybody voting no on it, but I, you know, without having this, the cheat sheet in front of me. So, okay. but, you know, th those, can, those are, our Senate's a very conservative place, especially amongst the Republicans. So, you know, people just have to keep in mind that, you know, we, 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 we are very center right and some a little bit further right than others. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think freedom of speech is under attack in America? Oh, absolutely. Just go in your universities and, or even in, into, the, into the, some of the uh, high schools around the state. It's being attacked all the time, and we need to protect that. You know, we start chip, chipping away at our Constitution, and it's, it's lost. You know, people, I, I one of the little exercises I do, just to give you an idea where, where people are. I went, I, I'll go into a classroom with kids and I'll say, how many people think we live in a democracy? And you have teachers and parents raising their hand and I get, I'll pull a little girl up and I'll say, say the Pledge of Allegiance. And you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag, United States of America and to the Republic. And I say, stop. What's a Republic? And I'll get stares. They, they really were never taught what a Republic is. So I tell them, okay, I'm gonna show you what a republic is. I bring a little girl up and I say, now you say we live in a democracy. And she says, yes. So okay, here's a democracy. This class took a vote. You can't be here, you're gonna have to go. But because we live in a constitutional republic, you have the rights under the constitution to be in this classroom. So therefore, they cannot take that vote to ask you to leave. So we live in a constitutional republic. Okay. With that, we'll have to wrap it up. So thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're welcome. Best thank, of luck. Thanks to for you. having me.